welcome to the Cinema Gold Show. I'm your host, Larry Lease. On today's episode of Flashback Friday, we give our review of The Invention of Line. But first, a word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Good Ranchers. If you're anything like me, you know that good quality meat makes all the difference in your home cooked meals. That's why I love Good Ranchers. They deliver 100% of American premium meat straight to my doorstep. Since I started using them, my barbecues have gone from great to phenomenal. If you're a foodie or just like a good steak, check out Good Ranchers. It's a game changer for meal times. You can use the link in the description and help support the channel. Before we dive into our review of the invention of lying, we'd like to remind you you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Just search the Cinema Gold Show. And as always, give us a thumbs up if you like our review. Hit the subscribe button and bell notification button to be notified of future videos. As always, give us your thoughts on the movies we re- re- review in the comment section below. And without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. This week, we're reviewing The Invention of the Line, which currently sports 56% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 188 reviews. The Invention of Lying is a romantic comedy starring faces like Ricky Gervais, Jennifer Gardner, Louis C.K., Rob Lowe, and several others you would recognize. It portrays a wild version of our world in which no one can tell a lie, completely changing how social interactions work. The protagonist then becomes the first and only person who is capable of telling lies, transforming first his own world, then the world in general. The film does a good job with this premise alone, But when it has to throw in any sort of plot, it falls into the same tropes as every other 2000s romantic comedy. The end result? It's a cute, passable film with a clever enough twist to set it apart from others like it. The movie starts with an introduction to our main character, Mark, played by Ricky Gervais. The information we learn is initially told through a date, the hall scene, where they show the subtext in subtitles while they're speaking to each other. However, it's in a much cheaper, less artistically deep sort of way, because there's no real-world interaction to act as a veil. Nonetheless, it managed to get a few laughs out of me, and was a unique way of displaying character, as well as introducing the world we find ourselves in. I wouldn't hesitate to say that this and the scenes directly following it are the best part of the films entirely. After we see the world through this one interaction, we're met with the sad reality Mark finds himself in. When he comes into work, he finds that he is indeed fired, that due to his unattractive appearance and lack of funds, Anna won't be going on another date with him, and that he has been evicted due to his recent job loss. After all this happens, he visits his mother in an old folks' home, as we're told she's likely to die soon. I will say that most of this is very typical for this kind of film, but once again, all these moments have a little bit of spice added in through the truthfulness of society in general. He's getting fired. Yes, he becomes rich. Yes, he sort of gets Anna to like him. But also, he starts doing really nice things for people in need. Redistributing money to homeless, solving relationship issues for people, and doing his best to make those who are sad smile. Then, in one of these several attempts being nice, things go off the rails. His mother, he finds, is dying in the hospital. Fearing that she will soon be embraced with nothingness, saying this to dread, he imagines what a perfect afterlife would be and does his best to tell her that's what will happen. Because, of course, she will believe him. The thing is, there are other nurses and doctors in the room hearing this. And they go crazy, assuming he's some sort of prophet, till he wakes the next morning to find he's incredibly famous, and everyone wants more answers. As he's unable to go back on his word, or maybe even unwilling, it's not, it's not exactly clear, he does his best to answer everyone's questions, and at the end of it, That's the accepted reality by everyone. After the craziness unfolds within Mark's life, it abandons most of the direction it's going in and hones in on only Mark and Anna's relationship. While they're developing the Mark and Anna situation, it turns out she loves him, but can't accept the idea that her kids will look like it, because he's not the most attractive man. So so she dates his arch rival, Brad Kessler, played by Rob Lowe. Through this process, it's clear that her opinion doesn't change, and she likes Mark much better. But to both seek her mother's approval, and through her own vanity, she decides to marry Brad. Mark then gets the note of this when she invites him. Of course, she hands him the invitation the day before the wedding, but he decides not to go. 
That is, until his best friend Greg talks him into it. The final meaningful scene is then the wedding, where, long story short, she ends up with Mark after he protests the wedding itself. Once it makes the obvious swap in focus to me, it falls off. While it still holds on to the premise of no lies, I think even writing here focuses more on character and relationships and does just the bare minimum to abide by its uh, promise. For example, a lot of what made the beginning entertaining was not just the fact that they told the truth all the time, but that there was almost no filter to their thoughts as well. However, as things go on, I think that filter develops a little bit, so we're left without with less hilarity because it seems there might even be a self-awareness to what's being said. Could have simply gotten used to it. But I don't think that's the case because it does come back at a few places. Notably, everywhere Rob Lowe's character goes. When he goes on a date with Anna, everything is taken back to the beginning. And people are behaving pretty awfully again. But everywhere else, it's not seen as much. It's quite obvious that in a film like this, you're not going to get Oscar-level performances. And due to the already insane world it takes place in, I don't even know if bad acting would be that noticeable. That being said, I didn't have any issues with the acting level in this film. It seems pretty par for the course. Similarly, the writing isn't what you're going to look at. And until it becomes an uninteresting pandering romance film, it was also perfectly fine. The main value in this film is going to be how it handles the idea that makes it special. And for about 60% of the movie, it does a fantastic job. At the end of the day, The Invention of Lying had an interesting idea. And it went for a majority of the film. Got several laughs out of me. While it fails to conclude in a fun or entertaining way, the hilarity of the first half is enough to put it just past many other mediocre romantic comedies. I will say that if you despise Ricky Gervais, like many people do, he most likely won't enjoy the film. He isn't his crazy self like he often is, but he's enough of himself to be annoying to those who don't like it. In the end, this is the first movie that I'm going to give a pretty good review. Or I should say a pretty good rating. Let us know your thoughts on this movie in the comment section below. Have you seen it? Have I convinced you to watch it? If you haven't seen it, let us know your thoughts on it. And as always, give us a thumbs up if you like our video. Subscribe to the channel. If you want to support the channel, go ahead and buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash cinnamongold. Your, sub, um, your support helps the channel grow, upgrade our equipment, bring a new host, be able to pay them, and hopefully one day take this show on the road. As always, thank you so much for watching and listening. 